Hey guys, chapter two was all about the Articles of Confederation, our nation's first constitution. And with the Articles, uh, there were some, uh, there were quite a few shortcomings. And so we met in Philadelphia in 1787 to quote, revise the Articles. And what we ended up with was a brand new constitution. And that's what we're gonna look at today or with this chapter, we're gonna look at the details of the Constitution, what's inside. Now, we're not gonna go into all the details with Articles 1, 2, and 3, because those are the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. Uh, we're gonna cover those individually, but this is like a, an overview of everything. And if you notice, it's a little bit uh, of a different scenery. I am currently quarantined and I've been delegated to the spare bedroom of the house while my wife, who is also quarantined, gets the run of the house. So I am stuck in a small third bedroom upstairs away from her. And so you just have to bear with me. And I may sound a little congested, but uh, you have to get over it. So with the Constitution, at the very beginning, we have a preamble. And this preamble is kind of like a, why are we writing this type of document? It's an introductory paragraph that tells us the purpose. What you are going to see later on in the document is this. And so the, uh, the Constitution starts off with, we the people. We the people tells us right away that the people of the United States, that we as members of society are creating this constitution. We the people, it's not the government is telling us that they're gonna do this. It is we are allowing the government to do these things. So we the people is the perfect example of popular sovereignty, which we will talk about uh, in just a few minutes. But there are six goals stated in the preamble. So it starts off with we the people of the United States in order to one, form a more perfect union. They wanted to create a government that was better than before, a more perfect union. They're going to two, establish justice, make things fair for all, ensure domestic tranquility. When you break that down domestic, is home, kind of like if you, you've heard the phrase domestic violence, violence in the home. So ensure domestic tranquility. Tranquility is peace. So ensure peace at home. Provide for the common defense, a military protecting our country. Promote the general welfare. So doing what's best for us as a whole. And secure the blessings of liberty to protect our freedoms, to protect our rights. We therefore do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States. So what you see is we, the people, want to do these six things, one, two, three, four, five, six. And how are we gonna do this? By creating this constitution. Now down below right here, I have a link. Uh, it's an old uh, Schoolhouse Rocks video. It's kind of corny and cheesy, uh, but uh, we're going to listen to it right now. After this commercial. Unleash the power of your imagination with the Marvel Studios Heroes toy and protein packed milk and everything that's on time. Chicken nuggets. So here we go. Here we go. And it's been helping us run our country ever since then. The first part of the Constitution is called the Preamble and tells what those founding fathers set out to do. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish a 
justice ensure domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense. Promote the general welfare and hand. Secure the blessings of liberty. To ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this constitution. We're just stopped there, uh, <laughs> but you can uh, continue watching this uh, uh, on, if you pull up my notes, you can click on it, but that's an old thing. I remember watching it whenever I was going to school. Uh, it has a little catchy tune, uh, but what you see, like I said, it's just the goals. This is what we want to do with this Constitution. And like I said, some of the most important words, it's the very first three words, we the people. What we see in the Constitution is, uh, or what is the Constitution? It is a governing document. It is setting up how we are going to run the country. How is the government going to be constructed. We see a, a division of power and a balance of power. We know there's three branches of government. The Constitution does have changes to it with the Bill of Rights and other amendments. The government answers to us. Uh, that's the uses of power. We have the power to change it. Now, is it super easy if I, Eric Schoenhardt, don't agree with something that the government does? No, I can't just add an amendment to the Constitution because I want to. Uh, it's tough, but we, uh, the people of the United States, do ultimately hold the power. And the government's power is subject to us. We allow everything that the government does. There's also restraints. We call this limited government. That the federal government can't do everything or anything that it wants. There are limits to it. With the Constitution, uh, it's about 4,500 words, uh, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not all that much. It's about six to seven pages typed. That's all. And when you think about it, you have six or seven pages and that governs the entire United States federal government. It's kind of crazy to think about that. The Constitution, three parts to it. First part is the preamble, which we just looked at. Then we have the articles. You can call them. Those are the sections of the Constitution, the different parts of them. And then we have the amendments. So those are the three main parts of the Constitution. And there are six basic principles in the Constitution. And we're going to go through each one of these six in this section. Popular sovereignty, limited government, separation of powers, checks and balances, judicial review, and federalism. Now, we've already started looking at popular sovereignty with the preamble. We the people. The government gets its authority from us. Think about uh, the Enlightenment, the consent of the governed. We, the people, are allowing the government to rule over us. It's not the government rules over us. It's we allow the government to do this. And by creating a republic, this established our authority. With a republic, we actually, I mean, when you think about it, we don't have unlimited power. It's not like that. We're not a direct democracy. Like I said, I can't just add an amendment to the Constitution or if I disagree with something that I get to, I get to make their rules and I get to change everything. It's not like that. We are not a direct democracy. We are a republic. We vote. We, uh, we elect representatives to vote on our behalf. And when you think about popular sovereignty, while we do rule, we do have the final source of power within the United States. Think about with the original constitution, the only elected officials that the people that we actually voted on were members of the House of Representatives. Think about it. The original constitution, 
allowed state legislators to pick senators. And then we don't officially or technically elect our president. The Electoral College does. And so the Constitution actually has limits on our popular sovereignty, on our authority. With a republic, with the idea of a, a popular sovereignty, uh, James Madison, in one of his Federalist papers, it was Federalist 10, said the best way to guard against tyranny, the best way to guard against uh, factions, these groups that fight for power is through a republic. That way there would be so many different factions that one group wouldn't allow the other group to, uh, to acquire more power. So that's popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty, once again, is just the people have the power. We do. And because we have the power, there's also responsibilities involved that uh, we have the responsibility to vote. And that is our way of keeping the government in line. If we don't like what the government is doing, what do we do? We replace the workers. We replace our congressmen and our senators and our president and put someone else in there to change it. We, in a sense, can, quote, fire elected officials. And... Uh, we have to be uh, cognizant. We have to be aware that uh, we can't just pick someone because they have a cool name or that they know someone or that they're famous for some reason. Uh, we need to choose our leaders based on what's best for us as a country. Another principle found in the Constitution is the idea of limited government. If you remember, whenever uh, we were under the control of England, we thought that the central government had way too much power. Then the Articles of Confederation uh, gave states too much power. We were trying to find that balance. And that's what we had here, or that's what we have here with limited government. We give the government some power, but not all the power. And uh, with limited government, that uh, there's also the idea of the rule of law that everyone has to follow the law. With uh, limited government, where is it found in the Constitution? All over. We're going to see it in Article 1, which is about the legislative branch. Article 1, Section 8, Section 9, and Section 10. And then we see it in the Article 2 with the executive branch and Article 3 of the judicial branch. And what we see in Article 1, Section 8, is a list, and it says Congress shall have the power to, and then we have a list of 17 different things that the government can do. And then we have Article 1, Section 9, and Section 10, which are denied powers. It specifically says you or the federal government or the states cannot do these things. You are not allowed to pass an ex post facto law or pass a, a bill of attainder, or grant a title of nobility. So we have the idea of limited government. The government can't do anything that it wants, because in the Constitution, we say you can do this list, but you cannot do these things. So they do not have unlimited power, therefore it's a limited government. There's also the idea of separation of powers. This is where we get the three branches of government. In order uh, to keep uh, power uh, away from just one person or a small group, we decided to break it up. Montesquieu came up with the idea of the separation of powers, the three branches of government. He's one of the Enlightenment philosophers we talked about way back in chapter one. But with uh, the separation of powers, we know there's the legislative branch, which is going to be found in Article 1. The legislative branch, where Congress, is a bicameral legislature. They have a lower house, which is the House of Representatives, and the upper house, which is called the Senate. Each one of them have their own powers. And we will talk about this in Chapter 5 when we get to the legislative branch. But for now, what you need to know is that Article 1 is about the legislative branch, and it's part of the three branches of government. 
Article two is the executive branch. And then Article three is the judicial branch. Also in the Constitution, a unique feature is the idea of checks and balances. So with separation of powers, each branch has their own responsibilities. However, the other two branches have power over that one branch. So we call this checks and balances. Let's look at an example. How a bill becomes a law. Congress, they make laws. We know that. They pass a bill. But what has to happen? The president has to sign it. So that's a check that the president, that the executive branch has over the legislative branch. Congress can't just make any law. It has to be approved by the executive branch. And then the judicial branch could declare that law unconstitutional. So the judicial branch can say, nope, Congress can't do this. And so it's just uh, checks and balances is a way that each branch has power over the other two branches to keep them in line. We don't want one branch from becoming too powerful or from acquiring all the power. So we split it up and we gave them power over each other. Uh, there are some examples here, but I have a chart right here. And you should pause this and look at it. And what you will see is the arrows and it's what checks, what power does one branch have over the other branch? For instance, if we go right here, so what can the president do to Congress? He can veto bills. What could Congress do to the executive branch? They approve presidential nominations like members of the cabinet, the attorney general. The Congress can impeach the president. So what power does the president have over the judicial branch? The president nominates the judges. What can the judicial branch do to the president? They can declare actions unconstitutional. And then we look at the legislative and judicial branches. What can the legislative branch do to the judicial branch? Well, the Senate confirms the nominations of judges and the Congress can impeach judges. And what's the power that the judicial branch has over Congress? Right here, Congress can have their laws declared unconstitutional. This is a very important chart. It looks kind of complicated, but it's not. It's just what can one branch do to the other branch to keep them from becoming too powerful? Con or the judicial branch's main power over the other two branches is the idea of judicial review. Judicial review is the power to determine whether something is constitutional or not. The judicial branch can review or judge whether or not something is okay. The interesting thing is that the word judicial review is not mentioned in the Constitution anywhere. However, the Federalist Papers uh, mentioned and made clear that, of course, that's what judges do. That's what the judicial branch does. They judge things. And in the case, in the 1803 case, Marbury versus Madison, which we will look at when we get to the judicial branch with Chapter 8, there's a case, Marbury versus Madison, like I said, in which the Supreme Court exercised its power of judicial review for the very first time, and therefore they established this principle of judicial review. One of the big topics, and I cover this a lot with my advanced government classes, is the idea of federalism. And federalism uh, can be confusing. Federalism is the idea that power is shared between a national government and state governments. And so this is not separation of powers. This is not checks and balances. We're talking about federal government and the states. There I am. Federal government and states and how they share power. That's federalism. Article 1, Section 8 
says this is what Congress can do. That's federalism. Article 1, uh, Section 9 and 10 says you cannot do this. Uh, Article 6, which talks about the supremacy clause, says that the federal government's decisions trump state government decisions. And then Article, or excuse me, the Tenth Amendment uh, says anything that the, any power that's not listed as a power in the Constitution for the federal government is reserved to the states. So all those things that I just rattled off is federalism, sharing power. Federal government can do this, state governments can do that. Well, what happens if the state and the federal government disagree? Well, we have Article 6, which is the Supremacy Clause, which says the federal government wins. And everything else, with the tenth, according to the Tenth Amendment, is a state power. So that's federalism. All those things uh, embody the idea of federalism, sharing power between the national government and states. And our Constitution mentions that, and it describes it. Now, with the Constitution, we do have, uh, thanks to uh, how it's worded, a strong central government. But the states do retain a lot of power. Now, it makes sense that the national government would have uh, powers to handle or protect us, national defense, uh, disaster responses, uh, interstate highways, that's interstate commerce. You would That makes sense that the federal government has that. And the government is, in the Constitution, sorry, provides this flexibility that uh, the federal government has a lot of power, but so do the states. And sometimes they actually share this power. They share responsibilities. And so federalism, once again, is just power sharing between the national government and the states. One of the big things with uh, federalism is Article 4. And there are four main things found in Article 4. So Article 4, four main things. One is the full faith and credit clause. And I'm going to go on and click on this link. And it's going to pull up uh, the actual transcript or the actual wording of Article 4. Article 4 is also going to have the privileges and immunities clause, admitting new states, and the guaranteeing of a Republican form of government. So let's take a look at this. We'll go through these four things, and then we will finish up with Section 1. Whoops. Maybe. Here we go. So if you read along with Article 4, Section 1, full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. What does that mean? This is really important, and this is... Uh, well, it's really important. Here's why. Each state must honor every other state's records and judicial proceedings. Here's an example. Your driver's license. Mine's from Missouri. If I go and drive into Illinois, do I have to get an Illinois driver's license? No. Why? Because Illinois honors my Missouri driver's license, and they have to. Why? Article 4. Uh, another example, uh, me and my wife got married in Florida last July, not this past July, but July of uh, 2019. We got married in Florida. We have a Florida marriage license. Does that mean we're only married in Florida? No, we're married in all 50 states. If uh, someone gets a divorce, they're not just divorced in Missouri. Every state recognizes and honors uh, that divorce record. That's good that we have that. And that's Article 4, Section 1. It's called the Full Faith and Credit Clause, that each state honors all the other states' records, documents, judicial proceedings. So adoptions, if you're adopted in Missouri, you're going to be legal everywhere. I know that kind of makes sense, and that's good that we have this in there. Section 2 the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities in the several states. 
What that means is that each state has to treat every other person, well, they have to treat non-residents the same. So for instance, if I call, let's say I'm in Chicago and uh, my car breaks down on the interstate. And so I call the, the interstate helpline uh, that you see on the sign. And I say, hey, my car broke down. And they said, oh, uh, Schoenhardt, you're not from Illinois, so we can't help you. Or if I call 911 and say, hey, help, I'm being robbed. Uh, and they're, oh, sorry, Schoenhardt, you're not from Illinois. We can't help you. They can't do that. That's the big thing in Section 2. Section 3 is admitting new states. And it talks about how if you want to add a new state, you can't uh, create a state from another state without that state's permission. And then Section 4 is the republic is a guarantee of the Republican form of government. The federal government makes a promise. The United States shall guarantee. They are promising that every state is a democracy, that every state has a Republican form of government, and they will protect it from outside forces. That is a promise that the federal government makes to the states. Okay, that wraps up section one. There is a ton of stuff in it, and I'm going to go back real fast to these basic principles right here. Popular sovereignty, limited government, separation of powers, checks and balances, judicial re review, and federalism. These are biggies, guys. You need to know what popular sovereignty is in limited government, separation of powers, and checks and balances, and examples of the checks and balances, like on that chart. That's going to wrap it up for section one. When we get to section two and three, we're going to be talking about how the Constitution has changed and how we can change it. And we're going to look at the amendments. Until next time, talk to you later.